Oops. We do a couple of things starting from uh, our, uh, our history with CubeSats, going to look at our vision on pocket cubes, and then ending with picture hardware. Uh, so I hope there's uh, something for, for every uh, one. So how did we decide to develop pocket cubes? Well, let's start with the most boring slide, uh, which is the program objective. So that will be program facilitates hands-on education. It guides research and development of miniaturized space technology. It performs technology demonstration and provides enabling ability for new space applications by the end of engineering of very small satellites. So here you see Delphi C3, and Delphi C3 was a triple unit CubeSat, or is still a triple unit CubeSat, uh, which is launched in 2008 and was developed as a first platform, as one of the first CubeSats or the first batches of CubeSats. Uh, and it's still operational today, so uh, after almost 10 years. Uh, and it's all, all with commercial off the shelf technology. So uh, I'm very proud uh, having been part as a student and later on in the operational phase as a project manager of, of this satellite. Um, so this was kind of the first platform to, to demonstrate that these small CubeSats can really work and it was also our first satellite as to, for QDL to, 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 to show ourselves that we can actually do this. Then we moved to Delphi Next. Uh, which is launched in 2013. And Delphi Next was a much more capable platform. It had uh, a proportion, it had uh, active attitude control, higher data rates, uh, et cetera. So, so here we showed really the uh, enabling capability of those, uh, of those small satellites. So 2008 Delphi C3, 2013 Delphi Next. And then what should we do? Well. First, let's see what happened at around the launch of Delphi next, or a little bit before and after. We had a spin-off company of Delphi C3, ISIS, uh, which is residing here in Delft, and they have grown to 100 people, uh, 100 FTE. So they're now the second uh, largest space company in the Netherlands, and they're completely focused on CubeSats. Well, there is Planet and Spire, where uh, we're making constellations, flocks of, of CubeSats for real operational, commercially oriented missions. There are the big institutes, ESA and NASA, now embarking on scientific missions with CubeSats. And then there are a whole bunch of other companies, uh, upstream and downstream, looking at CubeSats for money doing uh, science and uh, yeah basically we are university we, we are uh, and and doing the planet although I want to uh, we, we don't have that kind of investment they have an investment of a half billion dollars um, so we, we should be looking at something else so let's take a look at the timeline so in 99 the CubeSat was introduced, and it took a, a few years uh, before the, the first ones were launched in 2003. So we kicked off our project in 2003, uh, looking at those, that first launch, and then five years later, we launched it. And then immediately we started with our Delphi Next project, which was launched again five years later in 2013. And what you see on the blue bars is the uh, the amount of CubeSats launched that year. And you see that we de launched Delphi Next when there was already three steep growth. And although there has been some up, up, up and down since, you see that the trend is, is growing further and, uh, and further. And only actually launch capability is keeping the numbers uh, lower than they might, uh, might be. So, Pocket cubes were introduced in 2009 by the, the same person, uh, Bob Twix, uh, who introduced the CubeSat. Um, and here are the pocket cubes launched. So again, took a few years before the first were launched, and then it was a bit silent in the years after. It's not exactly the same for CubeSats, but you have to realize that in 2006, the, the number of 20, 18 of them were never 
entering into orbit because of a launch failure. So it's first a peak, then uh, sometime nothing, and then hopefully a shifted uh, pattern uh, compared to CubeSats, the same type of growth. So why do we want to enter pocket cubes? Well, that's because we are pioneers. With LPC3, we were one of the pioneers in CubeSats. And um, yeah, we want to, to do that again. And uh, we, we don't want to run five years behind the state of the art like, uh, like with, we, we should be doing with CubeSats. Actually, we're not building complete CubeSats anymore, but the expertise we have in-house we use to contribute to consortia uh, to uh, which are building uh, operational missions with CubeSats. We also don't want to do to build uh, satellites only for a hobby. So yes, it's education, it's hands-on, but we, we want a bit more than only education. We have a vision, and the vision is many, many small satellites in a network tackling, for instance, temporal resolution. So maybe a little bit less on spatial resolution or image quality or things like that, but a high temporal resolution. And we see this happening today for CubeSats, with Planet, for instance. But with Pocket Cubes, we can launch for the same price, we can launch more. So uh, we can launch, let's say, 100 of them on a vector R, or even 3,000 on a, uh, a VK launcher. Of course, it's not so smart to launch 3,000 on the same launch because they're all in the same orbital plane. So it's better to buy 30 vector Rs uh, and have uh, these amount of satellites injected in 30 orbital planes. Uh, this picture was shot yesterday here on this floor with all those uh, pocket cubes. Uh, of course not. Uh, but this is how it could look like. <laughs> However, there are certain conditions before we can move to those uh, big networks of pocket cubes. A sustainable growth, growth of the community, growth of the amount of funding, uh, and growth of, of, of constellations. First of all, we need to get rid of this picture, space debris. Uh, so we definitely need to be ahead of legislation and think how we can, how we can be an example to not only our own community, but also to the rest of the space world. And then you need to look at orbital lifetime. We all know about the 25 years, so 25 years after your operational lifetime, you should have gotten rid of your satellites. And for most of the small satellite missions, that means deorbiting in a natural decay. So this is the orbital lifetime of a medium area to mass case, which is currently our Del TPQ. Uh, of course, you need to draw different lines if you have other ballistic coefficients. Uh, it also depends on the launch year, but uh, as you can see above 600 kilometers, uh, it goes up rapidly, the, the orbital lifetime. There's on the vertical axis, there's years. And I didn't even include the 25 years because I think we should stay away from that. Uh, unfortunately, with all the right shares, all the big primary satellites, they want to go up to 600 to 800 kilometers because they then don't have to do a lot of orbit maintenance. Uh, and uh, th this is something which is currently the case that a lot of CubeSats and, and probably also the first pocket cubes in the next years will be launched in the, to those 600 to 800 kilometer orbits. But I hope we get the solution to get rid of that and at, at least make sure that we launch uh, in, in this segment. So uh, up to an orbital lifetime of five years. So then you're talking about 300 to 550 kilometers. But I want to go further to, than that. I would say we should be focusing on this area between 300 and 400 kilometers. So I'm happy that the target of the Vector R maiden flight is, is in between uh, 350 kilometers. And then we're talking about an orbital lifetime of only a few months. So, uh, if your satellite is defunctional, it will deorbit in a few months. You uh, uh, bigger satellites, even below the ISS, but 
if you, of course, want a mission longer than a couple of months, you need propulsion. And that's what we are also working on. So you extend your lifetime with propulsion, but once your satellite is dead, it removes itself. And you will see this happening, probably then on, uh, on daily or even hourly basis. Break off up your spacecraft, complete burn up in the sky. Nice firework. So going from Delphi Next to Delphi PQ, we like triple units for some reason, so we go from a triple unit cube set to a triple unit pocket cube. But the difference uh, in power is going from 8 watts to 0.8 watts, a factor 10. This is not a fair comparison because as you can see, there is deployables on Delphi Next and for Delphi PQ is not. But even if you would do a fair comparison, then the ratio from cube set to pocket cube will be four to one in power if you take the same solar panel configuration. Of course, we need to talk about money. Launching a triple unit pocket cube is about 200,000 euros, dollars, whatever. Uh, and of course, these prices uh, vary a bit, but this is just a, a ballpark figure. Um, so it's a bag of, big bag of money. For pocket cubes, you've seen the figure, and the co uh, it's, it's, it's coincidence that, we, uh, that I have the same uh, as Alba presented, 60,000 uh, euros, which is uh, a ratio of, of one to three and a half or so. Uh, but I think we should go further than that. I think, and, and I did some math with, with the, what the factor R costs, we should be able to drive it down to 25K for a triple unit pocket cube. It should be possible, but we need to look at lean surfaces, uh, lean administration, overhead, uh, very lightweight batch deployers. We can get rid of all the side panels of, of deployers if it's a pocket cube launch only, because there will not be a prime which is in danger. So I think this is possible in the long run and probably only when you're talking about launching 100 at the same time, not single ones. Of course, it's already mentioned quite a few times, we need useful applications which go beyond technology demonstration. As a university, we'll focus on technology demonstration, but also to, to, to think about new applications and to demonstrate parts of it. So we have a few ideas which are still ideas uh, and we want to investigate in the next few years to bring them or one or two of them to the, to the next level and hopefully work them out with a bigger consortium. One idea is looking at the gravity field of Earth. And here you see uh, a picture where you can see the differences in gravity around the world. And, and if you have landslides or whatever, that field changes. So there are big satellites who currently do that, like uh, Hirogochi. And uh, my idea is to see, can we make that smaller? Of course, not with the exactly the same quality. I'm not, not want to making the provocative statement that we can squeeze a big satellite in a pocket cube. However, if you talk to astrodynamic people, they, in, uh, in, in relation to uh, gravity field monitoring, what you want to do is really track the orbit accurately to see these tiny movements around the perfect orbit. Uh, and they see the satellite as a point mass. And a pocket cube comes down close to a point mass. So you don't need a proof mass anymore inside your satellite and you don't get all the trouble of having your antennas two meters away from the center of mass. No, your satellite becomes the proof mass. And launching mechanism can also be useful to measure air density uh, at those lower altitudes. Another idea is to look at the magnetic field of the Earth. This is what it normally looks like, but if you have solar flares, then the magnetic field is, is changing locally, uh, and you can even get uh, spins of, of, the, of the magnetic field factor at that moment in time. So if you want to measure these very dynamic events, you need to measure at many places at the same time. And maybe that can be done with commercial off-the-shelf magnetometers. So we are, we're going to investigate that, looking at how to reduce the local generated noise and really measure the external magnetic field. 
Uh, this is a slide from Alessandra, who is an expert in, in radiation uh, sensing. Um, so radiation sensors uh, are being developed all around the world, and ESA has a, uh, several uh, scientific-grade radiation sensors. But the next level could be on a single chip. Um, and especially, the, again, the quality might not be the same as these bigger ones, but if you have many of them, you can see the dynamics. Um, so basically, such a single chip could be integrated into a pocket cube. Some people might recognize the Netherlands here. Uh, this is how the Netherlands typically looks like from above, um, unfortunately. So maybe, uh, but it's very dynamic, right? It could be uh, sun, the sun could be shining for 10 minutes and then the next hour uh, it's raining. <laughs> uh, but if you want to catch imagery of the Netherlands, you should be able to, to, have to, to look down within that small window of time that there is actually no clouds. Or you might be looking at the clouds itself because they are very dynamic as well. And you need a high temporal resolution, not once a global image every day, like Planet Labs wants to do with CubeSats, but having so many pocket cubes, maybe thousands uh, or tens of thousands, such that you can do it from minute to minute. Another thing is temperature, also dynamic throughout the day. So temperature mapping with, with thermal imagers, like you have these handhelds which you can point at your house and see where your house is leaking uh, or look at, at body, um, people to see if they are fever or not. Maybe we can use them uh, as is or with slight modifications to look down to Earth many at the same time to make real-time global uh, temperature maps. Next one, uh, again the Netherlands. Anybody recognize where this picture comes from? Yeah, so I'm going to be very, very provocative now. <laughs> Uh, of course, I'm not going to say that Tropomi, which is an instrument like this, very, very uh, well calibrated, science grade, uh, perfect absolute measurements, that you can integrate it in a pocket cube. Absolutely not. Uh, however, if you look at the lens opening, uh, of, of there are many lens openings of Tropomi, it's about four centimeters, uh, which at least would fit in a pocket cube, but the optical train doesn't. Um, so we should definitely not try to get the same type of quality of this, uh, like this image. This is, by the way, air pollution uh, at the Netherlands. So we are one of the most polluted regions in Europe, or maybe even in the world. Delft is actually very, very bad. So you're smoking now about eight cigarettes uh, this day. And tomorrow again, uh, unfortunately. So, but... Uh, again, this is this this tropomi is imaging this uh, every few days around the globe, uh, and I think with pocket cubes we can complement that by measuring, for instance, every five minutes or even real time with with uh, moving the camera a bit on certain regions of interest, uh, and then see how clouds disperses. Uh, so the dynamics. We don't need perfect absolute measurements. We don't have very high signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, we might just be looking at a few spectral lines to, to only focus on, on carbon, uh, nitrogen uh, dioxide, but it's the dynamics we are interested in. Just to give you an example, I, I got a, a message uh, uh, two days ago uh, on my phone, like an, an, an automatic emergency message that said, warning, very big fire at Moerdijk with significant amount of smoke. Close all doors and windows immediately and visit some kind of wet link. Um, so oh, it's going automatic, unfortunately. Go back, go back. Okay, so this was the fire, nothing there, but it could be toxic, right? Uh, I have a very old house and it's very leaking. I have two small children, so I wanted to know, is this, is this very bad and is, is it going my way? Um, should I go to my bunker or not? So uh, I looked at the internet, couldn't find anything real time on wind direction, uh, but I found a picture uh, which was originating from Breda, and this was what the cloud looks like. So I'm living uh, in which is a city about half an hour away from it. This was where the fire was, and, and this is where the picture came from. So I knew I was safe. 
My colleague uh, Stefano is living in Breda, so he's, he was choking. He is now limping a bit. <laughs> um, but, I mean, of course, this is a creative solution to find out where it is, but it would be much better if we have those data real time and that, that uh, wouldn't even have message if it wasn't so urgent for me. Or if I could look at the internet and see, hey, I'm still safe. Uh, uh, I don't have to keep off all the doors. So how do we want to develop pocket cubes at TO Delft? Well, uh, we took five years for each satellite. In the future, we want to take one year or even half a year for each satellite. So we have, uh, we, we all know this V uh, development approach uh, from definition to operation. We want to do it iteratively and have these every three to six months uh, and then launch also every 12 months. So now about the status and design of the CPU, show some hardware. Last year, I spoke uh, on an interface. We've defined our own PQ9 interface, and we're, we still need to release it publicly because we've been tested out the data protocol extensively, and I don't want to uh, update public uh, too often. Uh, if you're interested, you can approach it. We can, I can give to uh, a, uh, a, a pre-release version of this. The whole message here is it's, it's one of the options you should, as a, uh, as a developer, choose what you want. PQ9 is very lean, but comes at the price that your options are not even limited. You don't have options anymore. Uh, the data box is RS-45, uh, and you can choose uh, between four different power distribution lines. Uh, and the only reason we have four is to limit the amount of current per line. Uh, but we even try to, to, to put type options in the box such that it's really clear and incompatibilities are, uh, are not of uh, like we saw happening very often with CubeSets. You cannot buy two CubeSet uh, subsystems from two different vendors and expect them to work together. Probably they'll blow up. The same connector. So the radio uh, below uh, the, the, the final PCB, which still needs to be populated in this figure. And above are the, the breadboards. We're using uh, a system chip radio, a la, which has many different modulations. Uh, we go currently for uh, GMSK. Uh, LoRa, for instance, would support it. It can go up to 300 uh, kilobits per second. On the VHF up, uh, huge, uh, uh, it's uh, it's cheaper, but since we have 400 watts, that's not a, a big issue. Uh, point one, uh, what, uh, oh, sorry, uh, open to, to one watt of transmitter power. And uh, we'll limit probably to uh, 50 kilobits per second. But you can do more, but we should look at And we're in the UHF band. Uh, we don't want to ac occupy too much uh, bandwidth. So here is an, uh, the N uh, board, which uh, in this quick and dirty you can see here. Uh, so we have a deploy antenna, and they will be resting. Here, uh, 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 constrained with a uh, Dyneema wire, which will be burned through uh, once successfully in all of it. Mount have our own. Uh, we uh, uh, have many rings as well around the globe or, or other colleagues, uh, the other the, the Pocket Cube and Cubes that develop. So Attribute in a collection of data, and then we have a central server and database, uh, and of course users, which uh, which can look innovative database approaches there. The power distribution simplified. Uh, we have solar cells, a couple of them, maximum power point trackers. It all comes down to a variable voltage bus connected to the battery, and this variable voltage bus is distributed for 
protected distribution law as is. So regulation, if needed, have this way safe potential conversion steps because everything is in key boxes as minimal as possible. We also have a system reset line which can be used, for instance, from the ready and high priority commands which uh, reboot uh, and then it doesn't data bus <coughs> might stuck for what that is or the computer might be stuck. So this is the, the upside of uh, the battery and besides there are thousands of, of uh, connectors. These are spring loaded connectors I'll show later. So we want to, to save a lot of money uh, or save a lot of money, save a lot of time in the assembly uh, and integration uh, and uh, we want to get rid of all kinds of loose cables. So this spring will connect, connect to the side of PCBs. This is then the other side, uh, just to uh, look batteries still uh, on top, but these are batteries from e-smokers uh, giving us uh, uh, 1.5 uh, amp hours of uh, capacity. Next are the solar panels. Actually, these are not solar panels, these are our solar panels. So, also a nice going to it goes to PCBs to be a rich structure. No one for uh, And on the back, we have our PowerPoint trackers. So, it's not on a more, but it's kind of cellularized, so each panel will have its own maximum power point tracker. You can even experiment with different uh, types of solar cells at each problem since it's all uh, standalone. This flat set, so here is where we test our systems for now uh, before we are going to integrate uh, everything. And I told you before about this. Uh, um, so this is a bit how it looks like. So uh, and a side and very useful where you have these spring loaded connectors pushing against the apples. No, it's all very approached and integrated. This is where we are now. We are also advanced components, which uh, will be on our first uh, Delphi PQ uh, or not. Uh, since we work iteratively, we want to advance uh, by step by step and just see whenever something new comes available, we can test being part of the next phase. Here we see the reaction with. Uh, the smallest reaction with the world, absolutely not. Uh, it consumes 10 milliwatts. And uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 um, and it was automatically sealed because we didn't want to remove the uh, lubricant and replace it for a vacuum grade lubricant because that's uh, the power consumption. Uh, so we wanted it hermetically sealed and uh, so still some work to be done. Propulsion, I will be very short on the presentation, uh, but uh, we're working on several types of propulsion. Uh, peak power is, is quite temporary acceptable. And uh, as you can see, it's lightweight uh, with less than one. Uh, one unit of a pocket cube, uh, maybe in the future it can be even smaller, or we can go for more propellant, because in the end you want delta V. If you want to go low orbit, keep your orbit, maintain your orbit there, delta V is needed. Uh, about 0.3 meters second per milliliter of water. And it's also very nice to have water as a propellant. So it's a resistor jet, and uh, for instance with, with a milliliters which could easily fit uh, we would have 30 meters per second which could extend your lifetime from 350 kilometers uh, altitude about a half a year or a year uh, you can get more if you want 
So uh, future, we might want to in more and more on the terminals. Sensor magnet, the uh, uh, transceiver. Uh, Etc. These are this, this is the further future, but but the whole idea is that you can have an assembly line, and uh, uh, yeah, let your thing produce as cheaply as currently mobile phones are being uh, produced. My presentation. That we, there have been a, f a couple of you doing thermal analysis uh, inside the satellite. This it has a range of about 40 degrees uh, and, and uh, drop down to minus five. So we're working on that with respect to the batteries. We have thermal protection on the batteries, so, so we're safe on that side. Uh, however, I want the whole range to shift a bit higher. So we're looking also at the color of PCBs. We now choose uh, to go for black, which is a bit better. Uh, what we certainly will not do is having heaters on board because uh, the power is so low, it doesn't make any sense uh, to, to do that. So no active control. Minus. Minus, yeah. But that's at this moment in time. We work very iteratively because if our configuration change, we need to rerun the thermal model. <laughs>